Father, we come. Uh, our hearts want to hear from you, not me. And so we would pray that the Holy Spirit would take my uh, broken, uh, misguided, flawed words and, and breathe life into them that we might experience you within our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Today's Palm Sunday. It, it got its name because based on the tradition of the Passover feast, which lasted about a week, Jesus entered into the city and on Sunday, and Israel greeted him as a king. So I'm going to have three teachings today, real simple, none of which find themselves in 1 Peter. How's that? <laughs> My teachings are based on three words. Maybe you'll think about these words this week. They're all events in the life of Jesus in this week, this Passover week, this holy week. Um, the three words I want you to remember are these. A tear, T-E-A-R, a tear, a table, and a towel. If you can remember those three words, you'll remember three events in Jesus' life and its application to us. The triumphal entry where he cries when he enters Jerusalem, the temple that he cleans, that he turns over the tables, and the Last Supper where he takes a towel, wraps himself, and washes his disciples' feet. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels. In chapter 12, starting in verse 12. This is about the triumphal entry. Verse 12. And on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, the Passover feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, the song you just sang, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Picture this now. Israel swells for one, all of, all of the nation of Israel for one week a year stops to commemorate the Passover. It, it's a significant event for them. Every year the Jews would stop for this Passover week because it reminded them of the deliverance they had from Egypt. That's where it comes from. That God delivered the Jews out of slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land. And the Passover was there as a result, the, the reason we use the word Passover, it was there because the last of the means by which God delivered Israel out of Egypt was that he had the fathers kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorstep around the door of their home. And if that blood was on that door, the angel of death would pass over. That's, it's that simple. And by passing over that home, the firstborn son would live. If there was no blood on the doorpost, the angel of death would kill the oldest of the boys. And as a result of that, because of the death of so many Egyptians, because the Israelites had put the blood there, Pharaoh releases Israel to leave based on that. And so it, it commemorated this passing over, the angel of death passing over, and Israel being freed from Egypt. Now, that became very significant. It became so significant, they had a week of that. And during that week, Israel would be somewhere, scholars say, between 200,000 and 2 million people would swell Jerusalem to take lambs so that their sins also would be forgiven. They went to the temple, and there was this incre incredible feast. And it's at that feast, the last week of Jesus now, that he comes into 
the, nation, the, the city of Jerusalem and the, the, the city parades him in. And, and people recognize him as their king, cut the palm branches, palm branches being a symbol of victory. They cut the palm branches and lay them on the street in front of their king, who is going to deliver them, they think, here's the big mistake, from the Roman Empire. That's why they're accepting Jesus as their king. That's why they're laying the palm branches, because now we're going to be delivered from Rome the way that God delivered us from Egypt. And that's who they cheer. In fact, the word Hosanna is a cry, a praise, a prayer that says, save us. And so the Israelites, the Jews, lined the street shouting out, crying out, Hosanna, 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 and in their understanding, save us, save us, save us. And what they were wanting is a physical king who would deliver them from Rome and establish a physical kingdom. Now that's key. What's also key is that Jesus comes not on a stallion, not on a white stallion. If you were a general who had just conquered or the king who would come in, you would either come in on a stallion or you would come in on a chariot, a golden chariot. A golden chariot that had the knives out of the wheels that you've seen on movies and the sun would reflect and all your power and your glory would be seen as you stand there in that golden chariot being drawn by not one stallion but maybe four stallions. And if you came into a city as the conquering king, you not only came in in your golden chariot, but behind you, your soldiers would carry the banners of the countries that you had conquered. And behind the banners would be the slaves that you brought with you. Now picture that. That's, that's how kings, that's how generals came into cities. They came in golden chariots with their victories behind them. Now I'm thinking some of those... Jews were probably on the parade route waiting for the, the chariot or, or, or at best a stallion. And Jesus comes in on a donkey. Catch that. In fact, not a donkey, a colt, the baby of the donkey. Shrek. You know Shrek? <laughs> Remember how small Shrek was? I, I, I think, my guess is Jesus' feet barely cleared the ground. I, I can picture a dad saying, hey, son, watch this. He's coming. The king is coming. You'll see him. He'll be real high. And the kid's looking up, and all of a sudden, here's Jesus. <laughs> Just barely above four feet as he comes by. Why? Because Jesus intentionally, because he was the one that requested it, wanted to come in on a donkey, and the donkey reflected peace, humility. He comes in peace. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Luke tells us that when Jesus comes through this throng, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people chanting, Hosanna, as he comes in on this donkey of peace, of, on this donkey of humility, when he gets to Jerusalem, he weeps. He, he cries. It's a powerful phrase to me. So why did he cry? I think Jesus cried because he knew those people wanted a physical kingdom when in fact he wanted to build a spiritual kingdom. He knew the very people that were chanting Hosea to him on Sunday would be the very people that would be saying at the cross, crucify him. He understood that they wanted deliverance from a system he wanted deliverance from sin. He came as a spiritual king to rescue them and us from our sinfulness, and they weren't interested in that. They wanted to be freed from Rome. And I think he weeps because they don't want, it, want what he had comes to offer. It wasn't the first time. John 6 tells us that after the feast, uh, after the feeding of the 5,000, when Jesus shut down the buffet line for free food, that when people discovered he wasn't going to keep giving them free food, they left. 
And so here's the question in this triumphal entry for us. Big question. What kind of king do you want Jesus to be? Because if you want a king that's going to get you money and health and wealth and a home and a car and he doesn't deliver, you too on Friday will ditch him. He comes as a spiritual king who rescues you and I from our sinfulness, who wants us to deliver us from the wrath of God, who wants to build a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that cannot be seen, and he wants to build that. And I would suggest to you that same Jesus 2,000 years ago who wept over people who wanted a political remedy instead of a spiritual remedy may still weep over us who wants a political remedy instead of a spiritual remedy. Jesus is not nearly as concerned about government and politics as he is about sin and rulership of our lives. It's not the macro. It's the micro. So watch out if you think that Jesus' is only issue, the only way that Jesus becomes relevant to you is physical because that's what the Jews made a mistake on Palm Sunday, thinking he was going to rescue them physically when he came to rescue us spiritually. He is our spiritual king. That's the triumphal entry. That's the tear. He weeps when we're more interested in that which is physical than that which is spiritual. He still weeps when we're more interested in the physical than the spiritual. The second truth that I want to show you this morning is found in Mark 11. Go there. Mark 11. The temple or what I call the table. Matthew, Mark 11, right after the triumphal entry in terms of the chronology of things, he comes in as the king. Verse 15, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves and he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, it is not written, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Powerful story here. Jesus comes into the temple and he overturns the whole business of religion. He overturns the tables. He overturns this fact that in the temple now, with so many people coming for sacrifices, that the system, the temple system had become corrupt. It was about money. It was about business. And so Jesus sees this place that should be about prayer, and he, and he recognizes and he hears the money changers, and he hears the bidding, and, he hears, and he's pushing around the cattle and the lambs and the sacrifices, and the system is polluted because the priests who should be charging five cents are, cha are charging four dollars. They're gouging people here. That's what's happening here. Poor people. People who want their sins forgiven, who are looking for a sacrifice, inst instead of paying the five cents that they should pay, are paying four dollars. They're being gouged. In fact, it's worse than that. They bring in a lamb, the priests study the lamb, find a flaw in the lamb so it won't count, and they're, then therefore sell them a more expensive lamb. The system is corrupt. It's crowded, it's noisy, and it's all about business and has nothing to do with about spirituality. And Jesus comes in and he turns the tables upside down. Now, let's stop for a second. I thought about this last night. One guy, a lot of money changers, a lot of priests, a lot of leaders, and one guy turns the entire system over. So let me tell you what I think happened. I think it tells us to some degree, Jesus' physical stature. I, I, I think some of us have grown up on Jesus being kind of like uh, radar on MASH. You know, the, he just kind of walked around like this, kind of moved his hair out of the way, and, and he comes into the temple and goes, would everybody please move to the right and stop doing what you're doing? Would everybody please go over there? Over there, please. Why isn't anybody moving over there? 
I just said move over there, but nobody's moving over there. He didn't do that, right? He's not five, six skinny. He's a carpenter. He spent 30 years cutting wood, putting up beams. My, my guess, my guess is he was strong. He was large. He, he wasn't a five foot six skinny guy with a wimpy voice. He came in, he turned the tables over, which is why nobody stopped him. And then he said, you've done wrong here. Now here's my fear for some of us. I think some of us want the wimpy Jesus. I remember as a kid, one of my friend's mom had a little plastic Jesus on her da dashboard. Still remember it? Little thing, four inches tall. She would pat it every time we went somewhere. I think she thought if we pat it, we'd get there safely. And it was that. <laughs> and I think some of us want that Jesus. We just pat him on the head. Just a little Jesus, pat him on the head. Not much there, <clears throat> but he's not that. There's a fictional story of a burglar who enters a house and is stealing items until he comes into the dining room with his flashlight. And as he walks into the dining room, he hears a voice say this to him, Jesus is here and he's watching you. The burglar is somewhat shaken by it and flashes the light again and can't see where it's coming from, where the person is hiding, and he hears the voice again, Jesus is here and he's watching you. And eventually his flashlight hits a parrot in a cage. <laughs> and as he's pointing at the parrot, he sees the parrot say, Jesus is here and he's watching you. And the burglar starts laughing until his flashlight drops below the cage and flashes on a Doberman pincher. <laughs> and then the parrot says, sick him, Jesus. <laughs> Some of us are somewhere between the parrot and the Doberman pincher, right? Some of us push Jesus around and let, instead of letting Jesus push us around. Some of us are Lord rather than him being Lord. C.S. Lewis does a great job with this in the Chronicles of Narnia when he has Susan go to the beavers and she's there to see Aslan and she says to Mrs. Beaver, what is he like, this man, Aslan? And Mrs. Beaver says, oh, no, 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 no. He's not a man. He's a lion of the woods. In fact, he's not just a lion. He is a giant lion. Susan looks at Mrs. Beaver and says, I would be quite nervous to stand be in front of a lion. And Mrs. Beaver said, yes, quite certainly. Anyone who can stand before Aslan the lion and not have their sh legs shake are either very silly or braver than most. And then Susan again asks, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver leans in and says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. Jesus, he's not safe, but he is good. And because he's good, we can trust him. And because we're, he's good, we can put our faith in him. But he has to be our Lord, not just our king. He's not four inches tall on a dashboard. I'm going to take this one step further. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, Paul tells us that now we are the temple of God. You, you are now God's temple. He says it twice to us. The Spirit of God dwells within you, and you are his temple. Why is that important? Because the same Jesus who cleaned out the temple in Jerusalem is the same Jesus that wants to clean out our temples. And your life may be like my life when in fact it's crowded by so much business, so many things that there's no room for prayer. There's no room for stillness. There's no room for quietness. There's no room for scripture. We have cluttered our, his temple with all of our miscellaneous 
to the extent that we no longer can hear his voice and Jesus comes in and wants to clean out our hearts, his temple that resides within us. And as Lord, he chooses to do that. It, the, the, in fact, here's the beauty. Jesus goes into the temple in Jerusalem on Passover week and cleanses it. The word sanctification we've been studying means to be set apart, to be clean, that Jesus sanctifies us. He sets us apart so that we can be useful to him. And here's the question I've had to ask myself this week, because I've got to live with these sermons for seven days. You only have to listen to them for a half hour. <laughs> my question is, what is there going on in my life that's stopping people from seeing Jesus? Because there was a lot going on in the temple that stopped people from seeing God. What clutter, what noise, what actions, what attitudes, what beliefs, what, what, what can people, when they come into an encounter with Bill, can they get a glimpse of God? Because the temple wasn't a place you could find God anymore. Jesus is the king in the triumphal entry. Jesus is the Lord in the cleansing of the temple. And the third truth, the towel, Jesus is the servant who washes our feet. Go to John chapter 13. The third picture, it's Thursday night now. They're celebrating the Passover meal, which is now what we call communion. That's what's happening here in the upper room. Go to John chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. The third event in this story. Tears, tables, towel, king, lord, servant. Verse 3, John 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. I'm going to catch that. Because this is the upside down. I'm going to read it again. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from the Father and going back to the Father, verse 4, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself, verse 5, and he poured water into the basin and began to the wash the disciples' feet and to wash them with the towel which he had girded himself. That's, that's the third picture. Here's the picture. Here, here's the radicalness of this moment. Jesus is hours away from being crucified. Hours away. And yet, and yet he still gets up. And because nobody else washed anybody else's feet and it needs to be done, he washes their feet. Here's something you may not know. In this time, a Jewish slave in a Jewish home did not have to wash the guest's feet. If you were a Gentile, you did. If you were outside of Israel, you did. But a Jew slave. It, it was so low to wash somebody's feet, even a slave, a Jewish slave, was not ordered or could not be ordered to wash another, wash another person. That's how, that's how low this experience was. This is how degrading it was. This is how humbly it was. It wasn't an act. It was, it, it was, a, it was something that the Jews despised. <clears throat> so why do I say it? Why does, why does John take us there? He takes us there because he wants us to know that Jesus turned the system upside down. The system. The system up till this point was getting to the top of the caterpillar pillar. The system was all about going up. And Jesus says it's not about going up and being served. It's about going down and serving. He tells us, you want to find life? You don't find it getting to the top, VIP, being taken care of. There's an emptiness there. If you want to find life, you find it by getting down and serving other people because it'll take your attention off your self-absorbedness, 
put it on somebody else. It's about their living and not your life. And you will begin to experience the fullness that you cannot experience if your life is about getting to the top of the top. I mean, think of the word up and think of the word down. Bill Hybel says this great in Descending into Greatness. Down, words for losers, cowards in a bear market. It's a word to be avoided, ignored, and dismissed. It color, colors everything, down and out, downfall, downscale, downhill, downhearted, and worst of all, down under. Up, ooh, up, up's a good word, up and coming. Winners and heroes, upscale, upward mobile, upper class. But Jesus descends. Once his life on earth began, Jesus never stopped descending. Omnipotent, he cried. The owner of all things, he had no home. The king of kings, he became a bondservant. The source of truth, he was found guilty of blasphemy. The creator, he spit, it, spit on by the creatures. The giver of life is crucified on a cross. The one who possessed everything became nothing. From the world's perspective, the cross became a symbol of foolishness. Yet in God's eyes, Christ became the greatest of the great on the cross. So what's the truth? The truth is that God calls us into carrying towels. God calls you and me into washing each other's feet. And you're never going to understand the kingdom of God until you begin to reflect on the fact that our God, our King, our Savior, our Lord modeled for us that you're always greatest when you're serving not being served. He turned the system upside down. Didn't, didn't just start here. Jesus said earlier, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Service in the kingdom, in the spiritual kingdom, is of the highest virtue. It is what calls us all to great things. So here's the three questions this morning. Three hard questions, so forgive me. Question number one is this. What physical thing do you want that if God doesn't deliver, you're going to bail? What physical thing? For the Jews, it was to be rescued from Rome. And once they discovered the king wasn't going to do this, they turned from Hosanna to crucify him. What is it in your spiritual walk that's hidden in the palm branches, that you will worship him if he brings you it, it. And if he doesn't, say la vie, bye-bye, I'm out. Got cancer, he didn't cure me of the cancer, bye-bye. <coughs> Marriage is on the rocks, thought it wouldn't be on the rocks, bye-bye. Thought I would have money in the bank, don't have any money in the bank, bye-bye. Thought my kids would turn out great. They don't turn out great. Bye-bye. What is it in your life that you are really following him because it's about the physical and not the spiritual? Big question. Here's the second question. What tables in your heart does Jesus have to turn over? Or better yet, what tables do you have to turn over? What, a, what idolatry is going on in your heart. What is of greater value to you than Jesus? What do you have to do to move from a house to trust, to move from money to faith, to move from government to you? What, what, what has to, what sin, what noise do you need to say, Jesus, come on in, clean me? so I can be used. Clean my heart. And then thirdly, what person do you have to wash their feet? 
to serve? Is it a wife you have to serve? A husband you have to serve? Children you have to serve? A neighbor you have to serve? that should be serving you and they're not the same way the disciples should have washed Jesus' feet, but he gets up and he washes their feet. Who might you need to serve? Because of this. Jesus, our Jesus, is king. Our Jesus is Lord, and our Jesus is a servant. And he calls us to a spiritual kingdom, and he calls us to be sanctified, and he causes, calls us to serve one another as he did in an upside-down kingdom to realize you're never greater, and you're never at your greatest until you're serving another person. That is the core of the kingdom. So we're going to celebrate com communion. And so you can come up. I brought a friend last night. He couldn't find the wafer. I started laughing. It's in the cup below the, the juice. So if you're visiting us and you're standing there, I, I laughed at him. I, we laughed all the way home. Take, it, uh, take the elements back to your chair. Hold on to them, and then we'll partake of them together.